Okay, I think we'll get started at this point. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the, I think the third seminar of our uh, the Massachusetts AI and Technology Center um, for Aging and AD Care. So my name is Deepak Ganesan. I'm a professor of computer science at um, UMass Amherst, and I'm one of the co-directors of, of the center, uh, together with uh, Dr. Nitish Chowdhury, who's also on the call. Um, he's a professor at Harvard and, uh, and a physician at Brigham. And so on behalf of both of us, as well as all the other members of our executive committee and our center, I'd like to welcome you all to this, uh, to this webinar. And so the, the purpose of this uh, seminar series is really to bridge the gap between you know, the two sides of our center, the, the AI folks and the, and the technology experts, um, as well as the experts in aging and AD, the clinicians, the behavioral scientists. And so we want to hear both perspectives. Um, we want to hear about the challenges that people face and that we would like uh, technologies to solve, as well as the um, you know, emerging technologies that are out there that can potentially be used to tackle these problems. And so uh, one of the big, you know, big areas, big challenges in the space is the longitudinal um, digital assessments of, uh, uh, of cognition. And uh, this is an area, there are some solutions, but but clearly there's, there's a need for a lot more. And, uh, and so there's a lot of interest in this domain uh, within our center. And so uh, we're really happy to have our speaker today, Dr. Kate Papp, who will talk to us exactly on this topic of uh, you know, digital cognitive assessments um, for uh, preclinical stages of AD. So let me briefly introduce Kate. Kate's uh, an assistant professor of neurology at uh, Harvard Medical School. She's also a member of the AD core of our center. She's a clinical neuropsychologist and at Brigham as well as at MGH. And she serves as the neuropsychologist for the AD center in MGH, the MADRC. And she's also an investigator in the clinical core of the Harvard Aging Brain Study. And her work is exactly in this domain of developing and validating digital measures of cognition for preclinical stages of AD. So we really look forward to her perspective. Um, so let me just briefly uh, mention a few logistics about this uh, webinar. So the talk will be roughly 35 minutes or so. And so we'll have time, enough time for questions and, and Q&A. Um, so you know, given the large number of attendees, we won't be really interrupting Kate during the talk, but uh, you can feel free to post your questions on, on the chat and I'll, I'll uh, read them over to Kate at the end of her talk. Or you can, for a few, few individuals, I think we can have, um, you can raise your hand and you can ask your questions after the talk. Um, please also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube eventually. So, so uh, bear this in mind uh, as you ask questions as well. Uh, thank you again for attending. We look forward to a great discussion. Uh, thank you, Kate, uh, please take it away. Great, well, thank you so much, Deepak, um, for the opportunity to, to speak today and, um, uh, I definitely um, I'm interested in folks' feedback at the end, so I would uh, really be open to the discussion and, and answering questions and talking about these issues further um, at the end of the session. But what I'd like to do first is briefly introduce um, participants here to how cognition has traditionally been assessed, particularly in the context of clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease and why improving and digitizing measurement of cognition is changing as Alzheimer's disease trials move towards earlier phases of the disease. Um, after that, I'd like to then discuss some different approaches to digital cognitive assessment in day AD. This is a field that's grown exponentially in the past few years, not just because for, of the need for more sensitive early assessments, but also because of uh, COVID. Um, and there's several different approaches to using technology um, that I think are worth reviewing. Um, and while there's a lot of interesting work out there on things like passive monitoring, um, computer usage, you know, steps, uh, actigraphy, other biometrics, this is a really broad field um, and too much to cover today. So what I'm really going to be focusing on is active measurement of cognitive function. And so after I review some of those different approaches that are being used, what I'd like to do at the end is to focus on um, my own work or group work from our group, which is looking at capturing short-term learning curves and discussing how this approach in particular might be um, uh, really ecologically valid um, uh, and a way to capture subtle memory changes um, in the preclinical stages of, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so with that in mind, just to level sex, I know there's people um, from a lot of different fields that are on the call today. Uh, cognitive assessment is a way to uh, 
quantify various cognitive functions like memory, language, reasoning abilities um, using standard measures as well as standard administration and scoring. These assessments are most often done in person and in the clinic. And the goal of the assessments differs depending on the setting. So in the clinical setting, um, the goal is usually to aid in differential diagnosis, to diagnose somebody with um, uh, cognitive impairment or uh, dementia uh, due to uh, Alzheimer's disease or other types of etiologies. Whereas in the research set, uh, setting, cognitive assessments have slightly different goals. Um, they're often used to help select study populations as well as to determine the safety or the efficacy of a treatment or intervention um, within a clinical trial setting. And then, of course, there's natural history studies that are looking at uh, associations between cognition and, and a host of other different factors. These are some examples of traditional paper and pencil cognitive measures for those that are not familiar with them on the right. Um, as well as some example data uh, from a clinical assessment or the types of metrics that you get on the left. So cognitive assessments by definition are labor intensive. Uh, they require one rater who's testing one individual. Um, they're also uh, expensive. Um, you have a, a highly trained uh, rater. Uh, most of these measures, even though a lot of them have uh, been around for a long time are proprietary and they're, you pay per single use. Um, and there's also a certain degree of bias that's involved um, in these types of assessments um, in terms of uh, variability uh, between different raters, different uh, sites in their administration of the test, as well as in the scoring. So it's even though there's this standardization procedure and that's at the heart of it, um, there's still a lot of room for variability in this type of assessment. And these issues are particularly relevant when we're talking about capturing very subtle changes in the preclinical stages of Alzheimer's. So as we all know, Alzheimer's disease involves a protracted uh, asymptomatic phase that starts with the accumulation of amyloid um, uh, plaques and tau tangles, um, followed by subtle yet increasingly persistent cognitive decline as the disease progresses. And so the ability to more easily observe these abnormal AD biomarkers in vivo, that is through either uh, CSF or PET imaging, and then more recently through plasma markers, has really provided the opportunity now for early detection during the preclinical phase of disease. And it's really accelerated uh, secondary prevention trials, which are occurring around here, and that uh, which try to uh, slow or uh, prevent uh, cognitive decline at these very early stages, so this period of secondary prevention. And so these are targeting individuals who um, may have these abnormal AD biomarkers, but they're otherwise clinically unimpaired. And when you look at old adults over 65, um, about 30% of, of older adults actually have these elevated AD biomarkers. Um, and capturing uh, initial evidence of this subtle cognitive decline remains really elusive. So this is data across uh, multiple cohort studies showing the really slow progressive cognitive decline over years that occurs in these unimpaired individuals who have biomarker evidence of Alzheimer's disease. So there's people who have normal levels of amyloid and then uh, elevated levels of amyloid. And you can see at the cross section across all of these uh, plots in different cohorts, there's minimal differences in cognitive per performance between those with and without elevated amyloid. But then you can see that declines um, are, are observed, but they're only reliably observed after three or four years of follow-up um, using paper and pencil measures that are uh, given in the clinic every six to 12 months. So right now, to determine whether a certain intervention, such as a new medication, may lead to cognitive benefit, um, there needs to be a very long study of four or more years and a very large sample size, so of a thousand individuals or more. And this obviously clearly impedes uh, the search for uh, more uh, uh, for treatment from both a cost and as as well as a time perspective. Um, so uh, right now, though, the majority of the secondary prevention trials that are ongoing continue to use these paper and pencil cognitive assessments to both select individuals and track them over time. And this is a table that's outlining the clinical outcomes in 80 trials from 2018, but these uh, measures are still the, the gold standard of measurements that we use today. So um, just to be more specific about the this challenges um, that these uh, that we have in terms of detecting uh, 
subtle cognitive changes using these traditional measures are mostly that these measures are probably insufficiently sensitive. So they were really designed to detect frank impairment in clinical populations, not the subtle changes. They capture these gross metrics of performance like accuracy or time to completion. Um, but you know, uh, reaction time test uh, also involves the reaction time of the examiners of how quickly they, they hit this, the start button to how quickly they hit the stop button. And we're not capturing really nuanced information. Um, and then when they're administered uh, at a single time point every six to 12 months, um, we know that the signal uh, uh, of, uh, or our ability to change over time um, is obscured by the natural variability that we observe in human cognitive performance, things that might impact any uh, person's performance on any given day, like mood, stress, uh, time of day, as well as other factors. And then finally, um, these measures that are used are probably insufficiently specific um, for their particular use cases, and I'm in particularly interested in Alzheimer's disease and preclinical Alzheimer's disease, but these measures weren't necessarily uh, designed for that population, and they might not necessarily target the specific cognitive processes, which we know decline early in the Alzheimer's disease trajectory. Uh, so with this in mind, there's a recent review uh, that came out by Omen and colleagues, and it helped to provide sort of a lay of the land for digital measures that are specifically designed to capture cognitive changes that occur at the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease. Now, these digital tests um, shown in this figure um, vary in terms of their hardware. So some of them are cognitive apps, some of them are web-based, used on any device with internet, while others are more novel platforms like digital pens, eye tracking, and virtual reality. But regardless of the hardware, there are a number of different theoretical approaches um, that they, they ascribe to, um, which are uh, aimed at improving early detection. So the first of these is to harness the potential of big data collection in AI or deep learning. Uh, the second is improving the reliability of assessment through more frequent testing, something called ecological momentary assessment. And the third is targeting cognitive processes that are more specific to preclinical AD. So uh, the last, which I'll focus more on, is uh, using serial assessments to identify decrements in learning. Um, so I'd like to discuss all of these uh, uh, these first three different theoretical approaches and then more, more, more in-depth um, discussion around uh, number four here. So uh, a popular approach to improving early detection is harnessing big data. So this is an example of using a digital pen, um, but the same approach has been applied to other types of big data like speech, which I'll talk about in a moment. So here participants are asked to complete a very familiar neurological task called clock drawing. So in this task, participants are asked to draw the face of a clock, set all of the numbers and set the time to 10 past 11 or some other time. Um, and uh, in doing this, you can uh, capture or observe a lot of information about an individual's um, uh, semantic memory, their memory for the clock, uh, their um, processing speed, their um, reasoning abilities, and whether or not they take an organized strategy to doing this. Um, and while clinicians oftentimes will watch individuals draw the clock and glean this information, you can't do this systematically in a research setting or really operationalize it. But a digital pen, um, which captures hundreds of variables related to performance by having a small camera embedded and uh, using um, this uh, special kind of paper, captures uh, uh, hundreds of uh, variables related to how quickly you move your pen, pen velocity, how, how often you lift your pen, how much time you spend quote unquote thinking versus how much time you spend writing. And now this um, company, which has since been in, in, uh, um, uh, bought by uh, Linus Health, um, has a database of thousands of clock drawings that have been collected in patients using the digital pen. And they've uh, developed algorithms to see which aspects of performance purely from a data perspective are associated with the clinical diagnosis and then more recently with AB biomarkers. And what's not unsurprising is that you can see that if you have a digitally scored uh, clock, which is in the uh, uh, solid blue line, you have a 37% improvement in discrimination or diagnostic discrimination between normal and MCI compared with if you have just the uh, traditionally scored uh, hand clock. So this uh, really uh, illustrates how uh, AI methods such as deep learning could enable a faster and novel and a potentially more sensitive, sensitive analysis of the same cognitive data using very similar substrates, so a pencil and paper. Uh, now, 
This is another um, example of using AR, AI or big data collection and deep learning, but this is focused on speech or language. And this is a company that's called Novoic and they collect speech data from a participant's smartphone. So they have the, the participant hears a short story and they have to relay back those story details um, and that uh, information is recorded. Um, and then, then uh, the, this company, uh, as well as a number of other companies that are working on similar types of processes, um, have been able to, uh, to take uh, large reams of data from uh, these uh, administrations and come up with algorithms uh, to, better, to characterize the different aspects of speech. Um, and then they've compared um, their AI algorithms, algorithms, which are in blue on these graphs, versus paper and pencil cognitive measures in terms of their ability to classify individuals. So you can see that these, this type of uh, uh, technology uh, of, of uh, capturing story memory is quite good at uh, identifying individuals who have mild cognitive impairment or mild AD. So this automated system that's done on a smartphone is equivalent to a 45 minute long in clinic PAC-5 paper and pencil assessment. And so that's a, a really promising finding, but you'll notice that it's not as sensitive uh, uh, at, at this point yet in terms of identifying individuals who have abnormal AD biomarkers. Now, uh, another um, approach uh, to improving uh, cognitive assessment with digital uh, measures is ecological momentary uh, assessment or what's called burst testing. And here participants are administered a series of brief tests multiple times per day on their own device. For example, they may get three different tests administered four times per day for a few days. And then by averaging performance over these multiple assessment uh, time points and tests, the hope is to obtain a more reliable or less noisy measure of an individual's cognition. So you can see a visualization of this on the top right, um, where by decreasing the noise in an assessment, we may be better able to capture uh, true change over time. I think this is a really promising approach. One challenge here is that um, there are issues related to adherence of getting folks to um, perform multiple tests, even if they are short and brief, but getting them to do that consistently across multiple days um, is a, a challenge to this type of approach. Um, and then another example is uh, targeting cognitive processes more specific to preclinical AD. So pattern separation or mnemonic discrimination is a concept from the cognitive neuroscience literature, and it's defined as the ability to discriminate among similar experiences. So research on pattern separation um, has shown that it's particularly reliant on the anterior temporal lobe, and that's a region of the brain that um, uh, is susceptible to Alzheimer's disease pathology. So uh, it makes sense that decrements in this type in performance on these types of tasks may really help us uh, capture the subtle memory changes that are occurring in, in Alzheimer's. So this is a, an app that was developed by David Barron in Germany, and it has tasks which tap into this pattern separation um, uh, cognitive function. And the hope is by uh, using this more targeted type of assessment and uh, using it on a, a mobile device that we can get at these more subtle changes. And then the last approach that I'd like to talk about more in depth is uh, uh, digital cognitive assessment using serial assessments um, to identify decrements in learning. So you might remember uh, this graph from earlier in the talk, and this is data from the Harvard Aging Brain Study. And something that um, we found particularly interesting when we started the study uh, back in 2011 or 2010, is um, we gave individuals the same story memory task, logical memory, once a year. And what was fascinating is people would come in the next year and they'd actually remember the story from the year prior. And if you look at the data, people don't decline on this task over five years, but they show this continued improvement. So each year they come back, they know more details of the story. But what's really fascinating is that these individuals who have elevated levels of amyloid, while they get better every year at the test, their improvement um, is, does not match that of their peers who don't have these elevated amyloid levels. So um, we, you know, these learning or practice effects have long been observed um, in uh, 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 cogn traditional cognitive measures, but they've generally been considered something that really obscures our ability to see decline. But what 
we've thought about, and, and we're not alone in this, is thinking that diminished learning curves could offer a more unique cognitive signal that could be exploited to capture um, meaningful cognitive changes and particularly doing that over shorter intervals. So given these findings that we found from this observational study, we wanted to see whether uh, diminished learning curves or reduced practice effects can be captured over a much shorter time interval and whether this can be done remotely or in unsupervised settings. Uh, we were interested in whether these uh, uh, um, subtle uh, uh, cognitive decline um, on, on these uh, 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 learning curves was related to traditional measures, whether they were associated with AD biomarkers, and whether um, they could predict prospective cognitive decline. So we started interrogating this um, by uh, administering the C3, and we uh, partnered with Cogstate, which is a company that um, uh, measures cognitive function, and we used their um, brief battery, which includes card playing tasks, as well as implementing two other um, uh, behavioral neuroscience tasks, the pattern separation task, which I just previously described, um, as well as a face name associative memory exam. Um, and so um, we administered uh, this uh, C3 um, on an iPad um, in people's own homes. So we were able to uh, get 100 iPads and we gave um, these iPads to 94 clinically unimpaired older adults. And we had them complete this testing at home um, each month uh, for up to uh, one year. And we collected a number of other metrics um, uh, on these individuals at baseline, including paper and pencil measures, as, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, imaging, uh, amyloid imaging for, pit for compound P to measure their amyloid levels, and then tau imaging um, using FTP PET. And then we looked at their performance each month on this C3 that they completed at home on their own um, on the iPad. Here are the demographic characteristics of the sample that we had. So we had 69 amyloid negative individuals and 25 amyloid positive participants. And as you can see from the graph on the right, our participants showed an improvement in performance over time. So this practice effect, um, everyone got better over time. But what's important to note is that their improvement was particularly notable over the first three months, which is highlighted here in blue. We then looked at the association between this improved performance and their degree of AD biomarker burden. And we found that less improvement over three months was associated with greater AD biomarker burden. And this is work from my postdoc, Rose Hooten, um, that was recently published. And you can see that that diminished improvement is associated with both amyloid levels on the left, as well as uh, enterinal tau levels on the right. And this suggests um, that in co contrast with you know, their performance at baseline, um, uh, that this diminished learning is really capturing something unique about um, Alzheimer's disease. We then looked at this sample to see whether their monthly at-home testing over three months predicted decline on traditional cognitive testing using the PAC um, over one year. And we defined decliners as those who declined um, more than 0 0.10 standard deviation and over that one year. And interestingly, this diminished learning, um, which now is represented in blue, was the best predictor of those individuals who went on to decline on traditional measures. And this was above and beyond um, their uh, baseline performance in green, and then above and beyond their performance on traditional uh, cognitive measures in yellow. So we then wanted to see how this diminished learning compared across different tasks within the C3. And in particular, we looked at two different versions of the face name test. So on the left, you can see that um, participants completed version A um, with the same faces and names each month. And then on the right, they got the um, uh, different faces and names each month. So B, C, D, the, these different versions. And what you'll notice is that all people got better at remembering the faces and names uh, uh, when they got the same version each month. But what's important to note here is that the amyloid positive group in red did not improve at the same rate as compared with the amyloid negative group in black. And this is uh, suggesting or replicating our findings over annual assessments showing the diminished learning curves for the same material presented repeatedly um, is particularly relevant or prototypical um, in Alzheimer's disease as it's related to amyloid, but it's also observable months um, versus over years as we've seen previously. So our next step in this line of 
research was to determine whether we could observe this diminished practice effects even more rapidly. So could we see this over days uh, versus months? And furthermore, could we see this on a participant's own device? Um, so not having to give out expensive iPads to folks, but having them completed on their own device. So with this in mind, we um, developed the Boston Remote Assessment for Neurocognitive Health or BRANCH. Um, and this is a web-based application um, that uh, we built in-house. And there's a number of tasks that we uh, developed within the system. So we used the face name associative memory exam, which uh, measures associative memory. Participants have to remember a, a name paired with a face. And then we have two other tasks. One is a groceries test where participants have to remember a grocery item paired with a price. And then there's a digit signs test, um, which is a measure more of processing speed. It's modeled on the traditional digit symbol substitution test. Um, and the outcome here is uh, uh, more about speed, the number of correct pairs minus incorrect pairs that participants can complete in 120 seconds. So we tested this battery of three different measures um, uh, and we, we uh, took a number of steps to validate it to make sure that this is measuring what we were hoping it was measuring. And then we used it to capture learning curves. So we had participants complete these same three tasks once per day for a total of same of, of seven days. And they got the same stimuli each day um, to really capture this diminished learning for the same information. We uh, counterbalanced the stimuli in the order of response options to make sure that people were, weren't remembering items based on where they were located, but it was really this associative memory. And um, we gave participants the option to receive daily reminders either via email or text, and they were able to complete what time of day they wanted to complete the task. And given that they're able to do it on any web-based uh, browser, um, we were allowed them to complete this on their smartphones or on their computers or whatever device they chose. We took a number of steps to ensure that participants would complete the tasks each day. We gave them increasing compensation so that they would get um, uh, increased compensation for each day that they completed. The assessment is really brief, so it's less than 10 minutes. We also had a range of task difficulties, so we didn't want people to get bored. Um, so we wanted to have some tasks that were challenging that it would encourage a sense of mastery day by day, but then others that were easy so that people didn't get discouraged at, at the outset. We also had fun brain facts which were provided um, each day uh, when they completed the task. So this is the sample that we've recruited so far to complete um, uh, this version of Daily Branch. And this is a sample um, that has biomarker data. And so we had a total of 181 clinically unimpaired older adults who were recruited um, from the Harvard Aging Brain Study as well as other observational studies. Um, 145 of these individuals um, were classified as amyloid negative on the left, and 36 on the right were classified as amyloid positive. So those are people who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. And in addition to completing branch, um, participants had undergone in-clinic paper and pencils testing using the PAC-5, um, and there was a composite score that we computed uh, based on their performance on this conglomerate of tests. So adherence to the multi-day testing was quite good with 95.7% of uh, the sample completing all seven days of branch. We didn't see that there was any relationship between the participant characteristics like age, sex, race, or education and their um, uh, completion rates, which was uh, important that feasibility seemed to be uh, across these different demographic groups. And then um, what we found interesting was that uh, individuals actually showed an increase in their uh, rating of enjoyability of the tasks over days. So people seemed to like the task more as they went on, perhaps because they got better at remembering the different items. And like I said, we gave folks the option to complete this on their own device. And within this sample, 55% used their computers, whereas about 45% used a smartphone uh, to complete the task. And in our initial validation steps, we wanted to just see, you know, is what we're capturing on uh, an individual's own device comparable to what we're capturing about their cognition in the clinic? And we were really heartened to see that there was a pretty good correlation between um, how people did on the branch tasks on the y-axis, so that's this composite of computerized tests, versus how they did on in-clinic testing. So this is an R of 0.6. Um, uh, shows that, that you know, we're capturing you know, 
uh, relevant information and that didn't seem to differ in terms of whether people completed the tasks on their computer or on their mobile device. So next we started looking at the um, curves over time. And so this is um, the multi-day learning curve. This is a composite and you can see this is the type of data that we're capturing about their performance over time. Uh, and then the next thing we wanted to see was, um, you know, how um, our amyloid positive versus negative participants performed in relation to each other. And this is our top line result here. And we found that while there was no difference in performance between our amyloid positive or amyloid negative groups at day one, we did observe this group separation between amyloid positive and amyloid negative individuals over time with an overall effect size uh, of medium magnitude of a co coincidence of 0.69. And so I think this replicates our earlier findings, um, but it also shows that this AD biomarker related signal and cognition can be detected over days versus months, that it can be detected across multiple memory measures, and that it can be detected in the home environment with a, a personal device. Um, there's obviously a lot more work to be done um, uh, with this uh, type of um, uh, work. Um, uh, in particular, we want to see how these um, uh, these curves operate over time. So we, we're, we're getting a, a sprint of cognition now, but we want to uh, capture these sprints at repeated uh, time points and seeing if we can uh, more accurately capture cognition over time by getting this type of data at, at multiple um, intervals. And then obviously want to also extend this to um, uh, seeing whether this is feasible in individuals who might have some cognitive impairment uh, as well. So um, I think there's also a number of other um, practical applications for these types of, of learning curves to clinical trials as we develop them. Um, I think that they can be used in combination with biomarkers to develop individualized risk or prediction metrics, which could facilitate um, screening folks into clinical trials. Um, I think if we can capture uh, uh, failing memory more quickly, we can then more rapidly assess the efficacy of um, more novel agents in the earlier phases of clinical trials. Another uh, possibility is that we can monitor cogni uh, cognitive safety more remotely. So there are some of these medications that are being used in Alzheimer's trials that have not been completely benign. And if we can um, measure cognition using these methods remotely, um, that's a, sort of another way to, to improve the efficiency, reduce cost, um, uh, and, um, and improve safety in these trials. And then I think um, most promisingly, um, these learning curves could potentially be used as an interim outcome um, that later predicts uh, a clinically meaningful endpoint. Um, so, uh, you know, again, um, uh, increasing the, the speed and agility of clinical trials. So, um, uh, you know, overall digital cognitive assessments you know, there's there's been a lot of interest in in smartphone based assessments, in particular in research, and I think I've already touched on a lot of these points. Where, um, you know, by using these types of digital assessments, we can reach a lot more individuals over more shorter in, uh, time intervals. Uh, we reduce the administration and scoring errors, as well as the the burden, um, uh, uh, um, the cost burden, and the time burden. We can also potentially increase signal to noise ratios by having this really much more standard administration and scoring. There's some ideas that these might be more ecologically valid um, measures because we're testing people in their home environments versus uh, in the false constraints of a clinic. And then by um, doing these things remotely, we have the opportunity to use these more sensitive paradigms like the learning curves um, uh, that we can't bring people into the clinic every day to do these types of tests. Um, but, you know, there hasn't been at, at present widespread adoption of uh, these digital cognitive measures within the clinical trial setting. And I think um, there's a number of, of uh, uh, steps that need to be taken before this happens. A, a big part of this is uh, validity. So are we measuring what we think we're measuring? Um, you know, are these measures corollaries to gold standard measures? Um, and then even more basic questions when we um, ha test cognition remotely, um, is the person who's part of the study the person who's taking the test? So um, is that, or are they getting help from others? Um, you know, and, and these things are, are critical, especially, uh, you know, in, la in large phase three trials where it's really critical that, you know, the person that you're testing is the, per is the person who's a participant, but, uh, 
also keeping in mind that we need to have protections on personal health information. So things like recording voice and taking pictures of photos also host, uh, introduces a host of other issues. So it's this balance between ensuring the fidelity of an assessment done remotely while also um, protecting um, uh, data and protecting an individual's identity. And then, um, you know, also really critical is this link to clinical meaningfulness. So, you know, how does how you perform on some digital cognitive measure really relate to your everyday, relate not only to your cognition on standard measures, but does it relate to your everyday functioning? And that's uh, essentially what we're really looking at uh, getting at um, in these neurodegenerative diseases. So that's to say that, that I think that um, you know, the adoption of these digital cognitive measures is certainly something that's going to happen, but it is an iterative process. And um, in order to develop um, and, and to have these measures adopted, they, you know, they have to be related back to gold standards um, and, to, and to show both the, the, their validity and then also to link them to, to things we want to improve in everyday life. So um, I uh, want to just uh, thank um, my co-investigators um, within the Harvard Aging Brain Study, uh, particularly Rebecca Amarillo and our postdocs, uh, Emma Weisenbaum and Rose Hutton, and then also our, our study PIs, Risa Sperling and Doreen Rents, and our, and our research assistants, uh, Daniel, uh, Steph, and Cassidy, who have been involved in this work. Um, and I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you, Kate. That was a great, great talk. Um, so yeah, I think we'll move on to the Q&A. So if you want to raise your hand, please go ahead. Um, if you have questions to ask, and please also feel free to enter your questions in the chat box, and I can read it out. So while we let people come up with questions, um, I, this was great. I think it was very informative as well. Um, and there's a number of, I think, questions here um, from my perspective. So um let me yeah so let me just start things off while uh, while people uh, come up with questions so i'm curious i think just your perspective on the on uh, on the you know if you blue sky what what kinds of things where do you see the gaps in this in this space in terms of new is it the validation of the instruments that you've created or is it actually the the you know improved ways to measure digital improved ways to measure cognition longitudinally um, to deal with the learning effects and the and the variability where do you or is it is it in the ability to you know maybe adherence is is a problem if we go to the general public where do you see the the big challenges um in this in the space you know, I think a major one is validation, but I think that that we're overcoming that um, with a number of funded studies that are that are looking at you know these correlations between these measures and um, you know gold standards. Um, but um, you know, uh, uh, I think another you know. You know, as we another sort of step in validation is not just relating to gold standard cognitive measures, but to, to relevant biomarkers. And I think that there's increasing opportunities to do that now that essentially plasma biomarkers are more readily available. And so that especially within the Alzheimer's disease field that we can, um, you know, get uh, these biological risk factors for Alzheimer's disease more readily so that we can extend these validations to not just really specialized samples of largely clinically normal, very uh, non-diverse populations, but that we can extend this sort of more broadly. And then I think that speaks to another issue around, um, you know, a, a barrier, and this is also a barrier of cognitive assessment using traditional measures, is that, um, you know, there are studies that are happening across the country and the world, and, you know, there's this real push to get much more diversity and represent representation in these samples so that um, that we're um, really uh, curing Alzheimer's for, for everyone versus within a specialized group. And so there's a lot of issues around these assessments of whether they're sort of uh, culturally appropriate or that they differ across groups. So I think that's another um, sort of major, major barrier as well. Um, uh, but I, I think that the, the key is, you know, there can be uh, lots of um, sort of big data, exciting ideas, but they have to be sort of linked back to these clinically relevant or meaningful metrics in order to really, um, uh, you know, determine uh, whether they can be, you know, valid tools um, in the future. Misha. Okay, I, 
fantastic talk and um, it's just music to my ears. <clears throat> we have a we have some experience with this for many years. We started in 2004, but one of the issues that we had and we have is that the traditional tests, as you described in the first quarter of your talk, are not very sensitive and are subject to this uh, aliasing error, which is due to the fact that the ability change over time and we don't capture that uh, 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 often enough. So uh, correlating the new measures with the old ones is, uh, is not going to be necessarily favorable, even though these tests are better, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, what we have done is try to predict the traditional measure averages, which are a little bit less variable. And we did pretty well with that. But I was wondering what your opinion is that. Yeah, no, I think that's a conundrum. So, you know, we're, we're saying that these measures are insufficient, but then I'm saying at the same time, but we have to, they have to be related. <laughs> uh, right. You know, the new measures have to be related to them. But I think it's, uh, um, you know, I think this is uh, sort of also figuring out what the role of these new assessments are. Are they additive? Are they replacing what's existing? And I think there's different context yeah. and use cases where there's sort of different goals for these different types of assessments. Um, but I think we do, it has to be an iterative process where we at least get some base truth of, you know, this, this newfangled metric is related to some sort of gold standard. And then we would hope that it would have additive predictive utility or um, that it would be also, you know, we're, we're showing validity, not just in one domain, but we're showing validity but, against a biomarker or validity against uh, predicting some future outcome, which I think would be also, that's really the gold standard in neurodegenerative disease is that can we take, is this, is change on on, on, a, on a digital measure predictive of where somebody ends up a year from now or two years from now, because that is really critical then for, you know, as an outcome in a trial and, and, and in, you know, uh, understanding these, these early and subtle changes. Yes, and in addition to that, actually, and I was tickled pink when you showed the individual subjects learning curve in a spaghetti graph. You can actually look at individuals and look at the also details of what the learning that happens uh, comprises. You know, there, yeah. there are different aspects of learning, different dimensions that could yeah. be captured for individuals. And that's a huge power for us. No, th thank you for pointing that out, because I do think that's really, that's kind of a critical part of this, is that there's multiple metrics within that learning curve that we can get information from. So, you know, not just where somebody started, but how quickly they accelerate, um, how quickly they, they, they um, uh, uh, you know, how quickly they, they acquire information and then whether they hit ceiling, um, you know, so there's, there's multiple aspects of information that can be pulled out, and I think that's, um, uh, kind of a powerful component of, of this type of um, paradigm. Yes, and in fact, it's a little dangerous to to average learning curves as we've yeah. been shown over the last 20 years. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're exploring a lot of the um, different, um, a lot of like different ways of, of, of um, uh, measuring those curves actually. So, you know, looking at maybe the area under the curve as, as opposed to just the individual's trajectory, um, but it's trying to get at those different pieces of information. But I do think it is remarkable how much diversity there is in the shapes of those curves for any indi any individual. And it'll be critical in terms of measuring cognition over time for us to be able to look at um, how consistent those curves are um, for, for an individual. And so we're starting, we have about, I think, like 50 people who repeated this at, at six months. And so we're starting to explore um, that that uh, consistency of uh, over time, um, but that will really be critical. Well, thank you very much. And I don't let other people take a yeah, so question. Take. Nitish, go ahead. Thanks, Deepak. Kate, terrific talk. Thanks for uh, presenting. So I'm curious about the sort of next application of uh, testing like this and sort of in in line with the the goal of our center to promote healthy aging at home. 
uh, you know, it's if if the, these are even though they're done daily uh, for a period of time, they're still periodic tests um, that may be done as a battery once a year or once every six months, perhaps perhaps in the context of a clinical trial, perhaps a little bit more often. But in general terms, not really meant for population screening per se um, uh, on a daily basis. But I'm wondering if you have, if there's anything in the literature or you've given thought to their use for diagnosing other sort of cognitive problems. So think delirium, for example, um, in, an, in a cognitively impaired population um, and this these being screeners, assuming they could participate in them or any other sort of more routine application akin to heart rate monitoring or, or things like this. Yeah, so I think one of the challenging parts of this type of assessment is that it takes a that there's um, there is a learning curve <laughs> to be able to to use this um, so that um, you know it's not something that's passively collected like or you put on a watch and it, it takes the data but it, you have to um, uh, you know log in um, and you have to complete it even though you're reminded you have to sort of navigate through the task and at this point I think we don't have enough feasibility data on whether this is something that folks who have a certain degree of impairment are able to do. I don't think it would be something that could be used in like in the context of delirium because it has this really, um, you know, you have to plan, even though you're getting reminded, you have to, there's volition and attention and a lot of other cognitive functions that are involved in, in, in actually just starting the task. And so I, I don't think that kind of setting would be be uh, you know it wouldn't be a sort of something that could be used in delirium. It would really be more for something for early detection. And at present, I don't think it's something that could be used for for diagnosis. But I do think it could be used at a higher screening level if we can get a reliable sense of how stable people's curves are. It could be something that you do every six months. Um, I mean that and and see like what is the the change point where somebody is declining, and that could be something that could in the future alert someone. Um, uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to talk to their primary care or to a tertiary center. But I think the immediate use case that we're thinking about is uh, deploying this into what are trial-ready cohorts. So groups of people who are interested in clinical trials and trying to get a sense of their cognition before they actually come in to the research uh, setting. Uh, so that's kind of the current, current um, uh, trajectory that we see uh, for this type of work, um, but I could see it sort of expanding to broader populations in the future. Yeah, I just wanted to make one comment about that because I think also this is this is kind of in the middle range of detail. So it's more detailed than probably anything that anyone would be willing to do daily. You know, and 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 it needs that detail in order to have the subtlety that it has. You, know, you can't have a five point scale and get the learning curve in the same way as you can with something with as much detail. So part of it is a sort of precision level thing. Like in order to have the precision to look at a curve, you need something with enough I don't, richness. Yeah. yeah, you need the richness of this. This isn't a three hour battery, but it's also, it's not a mini mental either. And even a mini mental people couldn't stand to do every day. Plus <laughs> they would they would not only know the answers, but they'd know the questions within a short period of time if they did daily. So I think there's something about the structure as well when you think about daily monitoring that if it's not passive, it has to be incredibly easy. Yes. And this is this is not only not passive, it's a thing of a certain length in order to get the granularity that you need to look at these curves. I mean, it's it's in a sweet spot for that, it seems to me. Yeah, that's a very good point. Let me take a couple of other questions from the chat. So Sarah asks, did the individual's computer competence impact their scores? Were all the participants already familiar with iPads? What did you do if they were not? And how did you assess their competence? Yeah, so for, for the iPad study, which that was the precursor to the study that where we use people's own devices, we um, uh, actually had them come in for a session where they we trained them up on the iPad. And this was a couple of years ago. So I think that there's probably you know, there's these secular trends towards um, improved uh, literacy, computer literacy in older adults. So I think there were some folks who were certainly unfamiliar, but they had a, a training session beforehand. And then 
um, we had our research coordinators on the phone to help them and um, that would do reminder calls each month. Um, and there certainly was a startup component with people having more challenges in the beginning that diminished over time as you know people got obviously more familiar with the, the program um, and using the iPad. Um, but the, the phone-based or the, the web-based one is much more user-friendly in that you know, they're, they just click on a link. They don't have to input any type of um, ID or anything else. It's just their own personal personalized ID uh, link that they get. And they, there's really, it's required, has required no training at all. Um, it, uh, uh, so that has been uh, easier. Um, uh, in terms of the question um, around, around whether we assessed for competence. So we didn't, we did a survey asking people about their usage of computers. We haven't actually looked at that data yet, but we have looked within the branch data to see whether there were differences in performance based on whether people used computers versus phones. And we haven't seen um, any um, uh, differences there, but we have, there are some confounding factors in that the people who use computers tended to actually be older versus those who use smartphones. So there's certainly things to, to parse out here. Um, uh, and um, we also, this is, doesn't really necessarily get to competency, but you know we know that if someone is doing a task on their own device, they could be distracted by things that are popping up on their phone or uh, you know in their in their in their own environment as well. So um, we do ask uh, some contextual questions like um, uh, what um, uh, you know uh, were you distracted by anything in your environment? Um, uh, did you have any technical difficulties while taking the test? And so we've recorded all of of that information for each day as well. And the base rates of those are relatively small, but we're using that more as a way to uh, you know, do quality assurance on the data as opposed to using it as a variable at the moment. Um, but it's definitely an important question that we're exploring. Catherine asks, um, for future studies in those with cognitive impairment, is there an interest in validating these metrics against performance-based or functional measures in addition to Hamelight and, and gold standard neuropsych? Yeah, I think certainly um, uh, we could look at performance-based or functional measures. Um, if we looked at populations who, who are cognitively impaired, I think that's a, a, a next step. Um, but I think we we first, before, before we get to that, we really do have to look at the feasibility of whether uh, folks who have some degree of impairment are able to, to actually do the task, um, which I think, yeah, we don't have that data yet. So I have a, just just a, maybe a follow on question to the previous conversation about um, these tasks being too long to do daily or frequently. And I'm, I'm just curious as, as the number of streams that come from these devices increases, right? You can track eye movements perhaps, you can have devices that have, give you EEG during perhaps while you do your study at home. Does that change some of, or I mean, this is speculative at this point, but I wonder if it changes some of the things that you can separate out, some of the effects that you can, you know, maybe you have a better sense of their attention. Um, maybe you have a better sense of, you know, maybe some of the variability can be understood or explained by having these additional streams. And do you think there's a feasibility of reducing or shrinking the test to be sort of in the attention span of the normal person? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think um, uh, capturing, uh, that's something that's of interest of ours, of, of capturing other passive information in tandem um, that can be already captured on a smartphone. I don't know if we, you know, like you suggest something like um, uh, eye tracking, but also other things like response latency and and tapping and, and, and even doing something like actigraphy or sleep and uh, in the context of, of how people do on, on a learning curve over a week. Um, I think those are certainly um, would be future directions that we, we definitely want to pursue. And, and um, I think that we could just get much more rich information. Um, uh, um, in regards to um, your uh, uh, second, I'm completely blanking on your second question was around. I think that was a question. I think that was the, the main question. So just maybe a final question on this. Is there a, you know, what do people understand about fine-grained variability versus the, there's variability across six months and that, that's the duration at which all, a lot of the tests have been done and a lot of the data sets are, right? What is, 
what do we understand about the, the diurnal, the, the, you know, the day-to-day -day versus you know, mood-related stress? You mentioned some of these factors, but what do we understand about the variability in cognition at that yeah, time? So, yeah, so my postdoc, uh, Rose, actually, there's a number of people who've done work on looking at intra-individual variability um, uh, in, in cognitive performance. And my postdoc, Rose Hutton, is, is doing some work in particular looking at this with our, our monthly um, at-home uh, data. And what what's, does seem to be the case is that it does seem to be uh, a marker of uh, some sort of cognitive abnormality, but it doesn't seem that it's necessarily specific to Alzheimer's disease, particularly in our data, so that you know, uh, increased variability on a day-to-day -day basis is not necessarily a, a good thing. Um, it's not a great marker of cognitive health, um, but what, what it is a marker of is sort of not very specific. Um, uh, so, so that's definitely, um, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, uh, is something that that others have explored, and and then there another Jason Hassenstab, his group has actually looked at um, time of day effects, and, and found in particular in Alzheimer's disease and in the preclinical stages that there are these time effects for these uh, uh, EMA assessments that you know later in the day people are performing. I, I'm not sure if it's more variably or worse, but but that that's coming out in some of their um, more fine grained um, assessments. So. Um, yeah, I think these are things that are definitely need to be explored more thoroughly. Great. We try to control that a little bit in terms of having folks complete the task at the same time each day. Um, but it is certain it's a it's a study variable that would be interesting to manipulate and potentially have maybe as a cognitive stress test have folks do that the task in the evening versus in the day, in the earlier in the day, then that could potentially capture um, uh, more relevant information in Alzheimer's in particular. Great, thank you, thank you, Kate. This was a fascinating talk, and, and obviously in a very interesting and important area. Uh, thank you all for attending, um, and hopefully you'll you'll tune into our our next uh, webinar, which you'll get the advertisement for uh, from Jason. So thank you all, and and see you all next time.